Hello, this is Domenico with Easynomics, and we're going to utilize one of the first economic models you'll be using uh, in your micro course, or if you're taking intro to macro course um, as well, it'd probably be one of the first models that you would learn. And that is the production possibilities curve. We're going to use um, an example of producing wheat or barley, which are two outputs that are very similar to each other in terms of the needed inputs needed to produce it. Um, in terms of wheat production worldwide, we're going to use the example of Russia. And we can see that Russia generates you know, about 50 million tons um, back in 2014. And also barley, we also see that Russia is the biggest producer of barley in 2018, generating about 17 million tons. So that would be our applied example. And that's what we see here. So we're going to use the production possibilities curve, also known as the production possibilities frontier, a simple model to illustrate the allocation of resources to produce two goods, in this case, barley and wheat. Now let's keep in mind some of the assumptions of the, of the model. All right, we're going to assume that our resources and our resources is another word for inputs to generate some type of output, which is another word for factors of production. And factors of production are categorized into four parts. One, one resource that's used to generate uh, inputs is land. Uh, things that are occurring naturally that we utilize to produce some type of good. We use wood, for example, to produce uh, a wooden desk or a wooden chair. Uh, we are growing, in this case, barley and wheat off of the land to generate that type of um, output. Two, we use labor as a resource to generate uh, some type of output. So labor as an input, farmers on the land, working on the land, planting the seeds, harvesting, etc., as a form of labor. Three, capital, which is a very overall term, meaning something that has the potential to generate wealth in the future. In this case, we could be looking at physical capital, things that are not occurring naturally, things that are made by humans as tools. So farmers use tractors and other machinery to generate um, wheat or barley on their farm. And four is entrepreneurship. The entrepreneur is the one that organizes the land, labor, and capital to generate some type of output. The entrepreneur is the one taking on the risks, uh, has some type of vision to produce something to meet the demand um, that he sees in, he or she sees in the marketplace, and thus uh, hires land, labor, and capital, organizes those three resources to generate um, some type of output. Again. Land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship are the inputs that are used to generate some type of output. And in this production possibilities curve, the output that's being generated is barley and wheat. And we have farmers utilizing, uh, farm, an entrepreneur utilizing labor, land, and capital to generate the barley and the wheat. Okay, so when we look at these resources, one of the assumptions about the production possibilities curve is that we assume that they are fixed, meaning that they are not changing. So we have a fixed quantity of resources, land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship. It is a fixed quantity of those resources and a fixed quality of those resources. Perhaps we will assume that the quality is low skilled and it is fixed as being low skilled. In addition, we're also going to assume that the technology that's being used, in this case, it would relate to the physical capital, is also fixed or 
constant or unchanging. So in this model, we're assuming that the resources, land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship, is fixed in terms of its quantity, its quality, and its technology. And this is important. I would like to emphasize this because this will come back again in macroeconomics and in global economy or international economics. We'll see that when countries um, change the quantity or the quality or the technology, it would lead to what we call a change or an increase in their long run ag um, aggregate supply curve. So we'll see that again. So we want to keep be mindful of that. All right. So those are some of the assumptions of the model. We have a fixed quantity of land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. The quality of those resources are constant, and the technology is also constant and unchanging. All right. Another assumption of the model is that we will assume that the resources are fully employed. Fully employed resources. We're also going to assume that there is um, maximum efficiency, that the efficiency is at its most. So we're going to assume productive efficiency, meaning that resources are not being wasted. Right? Resources are not being wasted Right. Uh, later in economics, we'll define this more specifically by highlighting that we would be producing a, what we call minimum average total costs, which is another word for saying we're producing where our costs are the lowest. When our costs are the lowest, that by definition means productive efficiency. So we're assuming that all of our land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurial resources are fully employed, that there is no unemployed resources, and we're also assuming that we're producing efficiently with no resources being wasted. And that gives us the opportunity to produce along this blue curve, which I've labeled as the PPC, or Production Possibilities Curve number one. Okay? So let's go ahead and look at some of the data behind this particular model. Now, when we draw this model, we have our x-axis, we have our y-axis. We're measuring on the x-axis the quantity of wheat in millions of tons. And on the y-axis, we're measuring the quantity of barley in millions of tons for the Russian Federation. And if Russia was to take all of their land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship uh, resources, all of those inputs, and just dedicated towards the production of barley, they would be producing at point A. Or if they took all of their land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship and allocated towards the production of wheat, they would be producing at point F. So we can create a chart to illustrate this. All right, a simple little chart. So here we can be looking at the production. Oops. The production scenario of points A, B, C, D, E, and F. Here we can be looking at the, out, uh, the output, how much of wheat is being generated at, the at that particular production um, scenario, and how much barley is being generated. So we'll label this, call this production scenarios. Okay. So we're going to have one, two, three, four, five, six. So let's go ahead and illustrate that. Right. And we can look at point A. That's a production scenario point A. 
Again, we are allocating all of our resources, all of the land, labor, capital, only towards the production of barley. And at that point, we get 20 million tons of barley and no wheat. So at this point A, the quantity of wheat being generated is zero, all right? Then we begin to reallocate resources, some of those resources away from barley towards wheat production. So we're then going to have some farmers move away from barley production and move towards wheat production. And as a result of that reallocation, we will incur a reduced quantity of barley while increasing the quantity of wheat being generated. And that takes us to point B. At point B, we see that the quantity of wheat is now increased from zero to four million tons. As a result of reducing the barley production from 20 to 16 million tons. This highlights how the model can be used to illustrate the opportunity cost. So in order to generate more wheat, it comes at the cost of reducing the production of barley. We'll come back to that concept of opportunity cost in a moment. Now, let's, dis let's uh, say that the entrepreneur decides to continue to reallocate resources away from barley and towards more wheat production. Perhaps there's rising demand for wheat in Russia, and the entrepreneur wants to take advantage of that, and they begin to reallocate. So they're reallocating resources to go from point B to point C. And that leads to, again, an increase in the production of wheat while reducing the production of barley. So here we are at point C. And at point C, we are increasing wheat production to 8 million tons while decreasing barley production to 12 million tons. And this continues, all right? The entrepreneur reallocates resources away from barley production towards wheat production. And we see wheat production rises from 8 to 12 million tons. while barley production continues to fall from 12 to 8 million tons. And then again, it continues. The entrepreneur reallocates more of their resources, more of their land, labor, and capital resources away from barley production, thus decreasing barley production from 8 to 4. while increasing barley production, I'm sorry, wheat production from 12 to 16 million tons. And that takes us to point E. And if the entrepreneur decided to allocate all of their land, labor, and capital resources towards wheat and generate no barley, that would take us to point F. And at point F, we see that there is zero barley being produced while we have increased wheat production to 20 million tons. All right. So the model illustrates how we can allocate resources away from the production of one type of uh, input in this case, or using those inputs <laughs> away from uh, the production of barley in this case is the output. Right, we're using land, labor, and capital as inputs to generate the output of barley. And as we reallocate resources, inputs, away from barley to generate more wheat production, we see how the barley production decreases, providing for the increase in the wheat production. And in this chart, we can see the concept of opportunity cost. What is the opportunity cost of uh, moving production from point A to point B? In order to generate four units of wheat, we've lost four units of barley, right? So going from point A to point B, in order to gain four units of wheat, 
the opportunity cost is four units. So we see that um, the ratio is basically one to one. In order to gain one unit of wheat, I will have to sacrifice one unit of wheat. Right? The ratio is four to four or one to one. Now I'm intentionally using a straight line and intentionally using a ratio that is constant to illustrate this idea of constant opportunity costs. which we will uh, contrast in another video to increasing opportunity costs. Constant opportunity costs is seen here. In order for us to generate more wheat, we sacrifice the same quantity of barley and vice versa. If I was to increase the quantity of barley, I would be sacrificing the same quantity of wheat. In order to gain one unit of barley, I must sacrifice one unit of barley. So regardless of whether I'm producing at point A or B or C or D or E or F, the opportunity cost is constant. Thus, we have the PPC curve being a straight line. And this is a reflective of the idea that the resources, the land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship that is used to generate barley and wheat are easily transferable, that we can easily transfer labor, land, and capital resources away from barley to generate more wheat because they are very similar cereal grasses. All right? In the next video, we will look at increasing opportunity costs, and then um, you'll see the difference between constant and increasing. All right, so I will leave it like, uh, like this, and there will be some, a series of videos on production possibilities curve. In the next video, we will probably look at actual growth and increases in the PPC curve, how that is achieved, and decreases in the PPC curve, how that is achieved, as well as looking at the concept of increasing opportunity costs. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, comment, and don't forget to subscribe and to like. Thank you so much.